it's Sunday the 26th of January 2020. I wanted to talk about Resolute Mining again. I know it's a stock that a lot of people are interested in and they've had a bit of interesting news flow the last couple of weeks. In the video I put up a few weeks ago, I talked about the price action here was particularly bearish and there was any, any news or positive gold price action that was sending the rest of the sector up. Resolute was getting sold into uh, on pretty high volumes. The short interest had been increasing and there'd been a number of announcements about hedging their, their gold production. So they've, they've hedged quite a bit of production. And then they were also talking about how they're in discussions with their finances to, um, to refinance their debt. Now, a lot of this sort of indicated to me there was a potential for capital raising and that's what's happened in the last couple of weeks. So they've, uh, they also sold Ravenswood, which I'll get to as well. But uh, this is first on the quarterly. Uh, I put a long post on Hot Copper about this probably two or three months ago when they maintained guidance that I was skeptical that they'd hit the number. They did come out and they were well below guidance for the final quarter. Uh, I think they needed to get 120,000 ounces and they only got 105. That was a pretty significant miss. And I think what, what emerged here is that they were really re um, hoping that Oxide would outperform again. And this has been a sort of a pattern of, a, of saving grace for the company in the last year, that the Oxide has outperformed while the sulfide circuit has significantly underperf underperformed. Now, that the December quarter, they had the roaster failure, so it was obvious that there was going to be a low number there. So they were still relying on that Oxide. And I guess... And they were probably relying on Mako to have a sort of an out out performance again as well. But that didn't, that sort of had an inline performance, whereas, and the Oxide kind of underperformed and it underperformed with particularly high costs as well. So um, 2370 Australian announced there. The sulfide costs, I don't, I'm not paying too much attention to that at the moment just because they're still ramping up the underground. Um, I'll talk about that as well. But so they've gone through the uh, individual sulfide and oxide results. I listened to the, the conference call on this uh, a couple of weeks ago or last week, I think it was. And one thing that emerged uh, that John Wellborn was saying was that the they were going to start reporting the results for Siama on a, on a whole basis and not report the individual results for sulfide and oxide. Now, this is this is a sort of thing. Um, I remember Apple decided they would stop stop reporting unit sales for iPhones uh, a couple of years ago, just as iPhone sales results were starting to fall away. And instead, they you know they report revenue and that sort of, sort of thing. But they would stop reporting unit sales, and this was sort of a catalyst for their their share price to go down. Um, you know, I don't think that's the case here, but it it is indicative of that the oxide is tailing away. So. You can see here the oxide operations have been the saviour here, you know, particularly those first couple of quarters of the year, uh, and it, from a cost perspective, perspective as well. So they were, you know, they were um, below eight hundred dollars an ounce Australian there, and, and on costs, and that's that's really been the saviour. But the sulphide has underperformed, and I think one thing that worries me about the sulphide is how it's going to perform against the DFS assumptions. So. The DFS, I've got the, uh, this is the updated DFS. The first one was published in 2016, and this is an update that came out in 2018. I think it's important with, with these guys to really go back and look over what, what they've promised in the past. Um, and that's the only way you can really gauge performance. I think there's a lot of apologists for this company, and they're not, they haven't performed, and they've missed, missed targets. And I think there's nothing really left for them in terms of, um, you know, the oxide's given it going away a little bit. They're sort of trailing away to probably 30 to 35,000 ounces there for the next couple of quarters and then probably lower after that. And I think the sulfide really needs to pick up. And if it doesn't, the market's going to start questioning whether the, um, you know, the numbers in this feasibility study were, were just not, are not anywhere near it. So I think you've got the grade here in particular. So we've, they've mined sort of mind an average grade this in the last 12 months about 2.4 probably on that on that chart so the feasibility study grade is 2.7 so I'm not sure if this is just a mind sequencing issue I've gone through the the previously the previous um, feasibility studies and tried to find what the grade distribution is over you know by production year but there's nothing in there so um, I, you know that's that's a bit of a worry that they haven't 
that you don't know what the what the grade is, what they're planning by a year. But the other thing is the recovery rate is incredibly high here. And I think I'm just not sure if they're going to be able to sustain that going forward. I think the recovery rate, if you see here in the in the first couple of quarters, about 70% and then 80 in the September quarter, which is the best. This December quarter is a bit of a, you have to ignore that one a little bit because they were processing oxide, I think, through the or transitional or through the sulfide circuit. So I'll ignore that, but but still, I'm 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 pretty skeptical they're going to be able to get to an 89% recovery rate, uh, even even when they were processing sort of that 2.2, they were at 80. So I'm not I'm not sure if that's going to be uh, possible going forward. And we know the the ox the sulfide circuit is is more than 20 years old and has a few and clearly has some operational problems and um, you know asset integrity issues as well. So I'd be um, I'd be a bit concerned that they're going to hit that target. And the other thing was just the run rate. So one of the analysts asked the question on the on the um, conference call about you know when they're expecting to get to that 600,000 tons a quarter, which is the uh, what the DFS has said. And I think the the response was you know not till the end of the year, not till the end of this calendar year. So what they constantly talk about sort of being in ramp up phase, but their you know ramp up seems to be ongoing. I guess that's. And that's my concern that this this ramp up is really so you can see here in the original and the action if this is the the update they did in 2018 by the end of FY20 which is uh, they changed their their financial year so FY20 ends in June 2020 uh, on this basis they were at going to be at that 2.4 million tons so they should already be hitting for the last two quarters they should already be hitting that 600,000 tons now I think they said in the December quarter they they didn't. They could have could have mined more, but um, they they didn't because they knew that the sulfide circuit was down and they had plenty of stockpiles. So, you know that's fair enough. But the September quarter again um, was not they weren't they weren't near 600,000 tons. So they I'm not sure about that if if there if there's still any issues in um, ramping up the underground production and if that's anything to do with the automation or you know. But this ramp up seems to be ongoing for. 18 months now, it's going to drag out to. Uh, so I think there's there's no, you've really got to see them. If if it's this quarter, they should be hitting that, you know, 30,000, you'd want to see 30,000 ounces from that sulfide circuit. Uh, the, the guidance for the year is uh, 260,000 ounces, I think. Uh, so I'd want to see at least 30,000 ounces and from the sulfide and then 35 and sort of those numbers maybe switching around. That's the only way I see them hitting that 260,000 ounces. I know in the, um, yeah, this year that, that those numbers were completely out of whack because they got 180,000 from the oxide and only 60,000 from the sulfide circuit. You know, I think at the start of the year, they were probably guiding to much closer to 100,000 ounces from the sulfide and probably closer to 140 for the oxide. So, the numbers are completely uh, out of whack, so that's that's sort of my concerns here. And I'm, um, you know, I maintain that the sort of while there's a technical risk, you don't really want to be in this stock. And they've got, you hopefully want to see all the capex um, taper away now as well. They've obviously got some financial problems that they've had to refinance this, um, you know, pay off pay off the debt. They would they the uh, the debtors weren't prepared to let them, um, you know, draw on more loans. So they've had to pay it off with equity. Uh, obviously, Ravenswood now is sold to, or pending sale. I think it's almost done. But you know, they they were. I talked about this probably six months ago. They're trying to work walk sort of both sides of the street with Ravenswood. They're pumping it up, saying it was you know a great project, and and then, but then simultaneously saying oh, we're trying to sell it as well. So it was clear that they were gonna they were trying to get rid of it still. Um, they didn't they didn't have the capital, I guess. So they're kind of saying it. You know, they they pursuing this strategy is um, they weren't best. This, this, the private equity firm is probably better placed. And I think from what John Wellborn said, they do have some of these uh, investment outcomes for for Ravenswood uh, were based on a gold price up. I think twenty one hundred dollars Australian. So they're still pretty, you know, that we're well above that at the moment. So maybe they get these funds, but. They've really sold it for 50 million in upfront cash and a 50 million in promissory notes, which I think has a reasonably um, good 
good uh, interest payment attached. But these other things, you know, you, I guess you can't really bank on them actually coming in. So they've they've got rid of that. And it's probably it was probably the right thing to do. There, there should be an Africa focused company. I think that's where all the risk is. And having the Australian asset in there, they don't get much of a, a upside benefit for that diversification because they're still, you know, they're in they're in relatively risky jurisdictions in like in Mali. So they probably um, they don't get a benefit from having an Australian operation. So anyway, I'm, I'm still I'm still pretty uh, pretty skeptical here, and I maintain sort of just it's easier to stay out of it. One thing they did talk about also that I forgot was this: the oxide, uh, and partly one of the reason why they had that up that high uh, high cost was that they had some geotechnical issues. I think there was a pit wall failure in uh, in the pit, so that's that's a that's an issue. Uh, and there's this some of the ore type as well might be hampering the recoveries. So those sort of things kind of might be the pit wall failure is probably not systemic if it's they're moving to other pits, but the ore types as well might be. You know, that's another thing with recoveries. If they're going to they're str- going to struggle to hit their recovery numbers uh, for the oxide too. So, like I said, they're combining these two together now. So we probably won't be able to track. I'm not sure what what point they'll start doing that. Whether it's from the next quarterly, but sooner or later they're going to they're going to change the way they report. So we won't really know how well the oxide perfor- is performing and how well the sulfide is performing. So I think that's a little. I'm a little bit cynical of that move. Uh, you know that, but they have said that there's the part of the reason for that is that the, the, the two sort of morph together over time. And I think that's partly because the oxide is being, uh, you know, is reducing over time. They don't have this, the ore available. I know that they've got the um, tobaccaroni as well. They've got the underground that they're trying to develop there. The problem is, I think that they're not going to be able to get the, the tons from the underground. Just trying to find the, uh, the slide about tobaccaroni here. There it is, high grade intersection. So then they've got a, they've got a decent underground resource there, but you're not going to be able to to mine this enough to sustain oxide production at say 40,000 ounces. So they, it's going to gradually taper off. They'll still be able to get some good high grades, I think, from the underground. But again, that's going to cost more money you know, to develop that, which capital which they don't really have uh, just lying around at the moment. So it's going to be up to the sulfide to do the heavy lifting. And as I said, I'm a little bit skeptical that that's going to hit the targets uh, so we should start to see in the next quarter or two if they don't deliver the, and they still have a high cash burn the market's probably not going to um, be very kind on them I think the market's actually been relatively kind on them compared to some other companies that I've and I've talked about that in previous videos so Resolute is still an avoid for me I uh, you know I think obviously the chart looks you know it's forming a bit of a base here you'd expect to see the short interest kind of maybe decline I think Obviously, that the capital raising was at a dollar ten. It's probably been trying. They've probably been negotiating that for a few weeks. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if that you know that's partly this why this price action has come out like this. People are buying it above, just below the capital raising price, and selling it above. And and the shorters were probably um, aware of it, or you know had some had some inside info perhaps, and that's been the. Uh, reason why they were happy to push it down from that when it went up into those high 120s. It's good profit if you can buy those shares back at $1.10 in the capital raising. So it's another example of sort of pay attention, you know, paying attention to price action, particularly when it's under, when, it, when there's good news come, comes out and it's not performing well. I mean, and good news is really just the gold price at the moment. Um, when that good news comes out and, and Resolute stock starts to be, you know, it's still under pressure high short interest, that's a bit of a warning sign that there's some uh, bad news coming or a capital raising in this case. So just another, t- another time to be aware of the price action and that gives you a bit of a leading indicator at some times. Uh, so that's that's probably enough on Resolute. As I said, I don't own the stock and I, I'm, I'm not willing to go in with the level of technical risk I think is still there. And the uh, you know all the things that I've talked about in terms of production, probably that I haven't mentioned really cost as well. So they've guided to $1,000 an ounce uh, US, I think, r- roughly or a little bit under this year. So we'll see if they can hit those numbers. I'm a bit skeptical they're going to hit those as well. Um, so we'll see how we go. And uh, yeah, I'll put up some uh, some other videos and some of the other quarterlies from the ASX companies as well. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm.